I'm now leaving planet Earth and I'm about to head out somewhere really, 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 really far in our solar system. Let's go to a place called Eris. Now this is Space Engine, a, a game that is more of a simulator than a game, and this is Eris. What is Eris? It is one of the dwarf planets. Why is it important? You'll find out in this video. Welcome to Eris, and welcome to What the Math. <laughs> So today we're going to be talking about Ares and we're going to try to do a few things with it and possibly even terraform it. Um, this is uh, our solar system, you can see our Earth and Mars here. Now where is Ares? Where, where is it? And this is actually why we couldn't really find it for a very long time, because it is not uh, very visible at first. It's actually right here. Its orbit is very, 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 very steep. It's, it actually has 44 degree inclination, and compared to everything else, it sort of orbits in this plane where everything else is actually in this plane. Now, for this reason, people were not even looking for it. We always look um, for... Th oh, here. Let's zoom into it. And it's really, really dark, so you can't even see the surface. The best way to see the surface is by looking at it right here. Now, unfortunately, if you are a space scientist on Earth, you usually use this plane to look for new um, new asteroids, new comets, um, new objects in our solar system, because most of the things in our solar system has a pretty much the same plane. You would never really look up over there or down over there to find some kind of a new object. And this is actually why we couldn't find Ares for so long. But it is there, and we finally found it in 2003. And this is actually how far away it is from the sun and from everything else. It's at a distance of approximately uh, 97 astronomical units, which is really, really far. It's actually about six times farther than Pluto. Um, and the closest approach to the sun is a a very close to or similar to um, the distance of Pluto. So it's about 37 astronomical units. Uh, and for this obvious reason, it is ridiculously cold here. It is very, very dark. And the sun is just a tiny speck in the sky. Now, the interesting thing about uh, Ares is that it's actually more massive than Pluto. It's actually 127% more massive, meaning that um, it has more mass, but it is smaller in size, which also implies that it has higher density. What does that mean? Well, it means that this object right here has uh, less water and less um, ices than Pluto and has more rocky stuff. It also implies that it was probably made somewhere inside the solar system and then, because of Neptune or some other gas giant, got shot out into the outer solar system and is now orbiting here. It also suggests that there's other objects like it, and we've already found a few, um, we'll talk about them in the future videos, but there's quite a lot of objects to discover and maybe some that are even more massive than this. In comparison to our planet, it's only about 0.2%. In other words, it's really, really not that big. When I show it to you next to Earth, you'll see how small it actually is. But at the same time, this is actually the largest object in our solar system that has still not been visited because it's so far away. We've actually visited pretty much everything else now, except for Eris. And what is Ares? What does it even mean? Well, Ares is the name of a uh, goddess from Greek mythology, and her equivalent in Roman mythology would be Discordia. So it's basically a goddess of like strife and discord. It's it's almost the opposite of harmony, and um, so yeah, kind of like war, I guess. And but not really war. But for that reason, uh, the original name of Ares was actually Xena. They actually wanted to name it Xena after Xena the warrior princess, but unfortunately, the Astronomical Society refused that name, and instead, uh, Ares was chosen uh, as a name. So here is Mercury in comparison to Ares. So uh, just maybe like two times bigger, maybe a little bit less. Here is Earth in comparison to Ares. So um, it is definitely not a small dwarf planet, but it's definitely not that big either. And in comparison to Pluto, this is what the size is like. So Pluto is just a little bit bigger than Aries, um, whereas Aries is uh, more massive. So let's just put them in orbit around each other and see what happens. And here we go. So let's hope they don't smack into each other or don't fly away. Let's see what happens. I'm going to accelerate time a little bit. And they should establish some sort of a berry center right between them. The, so they're actually kind of dancing around each other right now even though it doesn't actually look that like that. But their size is comparable. 
Now, the reason why we know its mass so accurately and its size relatively accurately as well is because of its moon. It actually does have a moon, which is not shown here. And its uh, moon's name is Dysnomia. I'm going to see if, the, if this object actually exists in this game. And um, no, it doesn't. So, and Dysnomia, according to mythology, is the daughter of Ares. Um, and unfortunately, we can't really represent it here. Uh, but it's much, much smaller than, than Ares. It's only about maybe... Maybe about this big, same same size as Palace, maybe even smaller than that. Um, obviously, we know, we know a lot less about this Nomi than we know about Ares because they're both really far away and they, they're really, 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 really dark. Now, here is why Ares is so important. And actually, this is why I decided to even put Pluto here because Pluto is really, really upset at Ares for doing something. In 2005-ish, when it was actually discovered that Ares is so massive and that it's possibly a 10th planet. Um, it was obviously referred to as Planet X, the 10th planet in our solar system. And this is actually how they even found it. They were looking for this so-called Planet X, which is kind of a conspiracy theory, but, you know, people were still looking for it. And so when it was discovered, um, at, at one point, everyone was like, okay, so we have 10 planets. Let's add it to the astronomical calendar, uh, not calendar, astronomical map. Um, and then they found more. They found Makemake, they found a Sedna, and they kept just finding more and more of these objects that were in this so-called trans-Neptunian orbit, basically orbit past Neptune. And for that reason, Pluto has been demoted. So it was if it was not up to Ares, Pluto would still be a planet. So Ares, this is your fault, and this is why we're going to be smacking things into you today, so that you can get terraformed. And actually, within a few days, scientists were able to find at least two more dwarf planets. Specifically, I'm talking about Makemake and Haumea. Uh, and uh, obviously, they were also designated as dwarf planets. Now, why was Ares really not discovered before? Well, apart from the fact that we were looking in the wrong spot, um, the other thing is that it's actually, it's moving really, really slow in our sky. So when uh, scientists are looking for new discoveries, they usually look at how things have changed in um, in our sky, uh, depending on, you know, time past. So if I were to look at this from, let's just say from Earth or, you know, from the sun, um, you can kind of see that Ares is moving so slow in comparison to the stars. Even if I accelerate time, it's moving really slow. Its orbit is actually something like 558 years. So it's really hard to see it in the sky. It's just barely even moving. And because of that, it was, you know, it took us quite a long time to discover it. But the interesting thing about it is that, is that once you actually look at it, once you actually try to see it, um, it's kind of reflective. There's quite a lot of reflection going on for, uh, on Aries, which really implies that the albedo of this planet is really high. It's actually, and it's not said here, but it's actually 96%. In other words, it is a very reflective object, uh, almost close to like a mirror. Um, basically, most of the light is reflected from it, and that's because there's so much methane deposited on the surface. Because it's so cold here, a lot of methane gets deposited on the surface of Aries, and all of this methane is basically ice, but it's a very, very white ice. So this whole dwarf planet is essentially just a big white bowl of methane ice. Now, in a previous video when I was terraforming Pluto, I mentioned that methane is a great, great, great greenhouse gas. And that means that we can actually... Here, let's slow this down. Oh, we can see the surface now. Yay, it's because albedo was set too slow. Anyway, so uh, methane is actually... Uh, an excellent greenhouse gas, so if we can actually somehow turn the methane ice into methane um, gas, we can actually try to terraform this planet. But how do we do this? Because it's so far away from the sun, it's reflecting a lot of the light, and it's cold. It's like only about 30 degrees Kelvin here, which is uh, 30 degrees above the below zero. So what do we do? How do we do it? Well, we need to possibly start hitting it with other things. So what we could do initially, just to warm it, it's, uh, it up a little bit, is uh, divert one of the other trans-Neptunian objects and hit it into um, Ares. As a punishment for taking Pluto's crown of planets away. And also because there's really no other way to warm up uh, this really, really distant object. 
And because its composition is probably very similar to Pluto, it probably has a lot of other stuff as well. So it has um, a very similar composition of ices, it probably has water underneath, and maybe even has a liquid ocean underneath. Um, so all of this is good news for us, but before we go into anything, we really need to try to warm it up. So let's choose a few um, asteroids and smack them into Aries. I'm also going to simulate a little bit of water on the surface, just because it's just, this is a little bit more realistic. So, it's very likely that we will be able to divert a few smaller asteroids to smack into it. So, this is what we're going to start with. We're going to watch the temperature here. And what we're trying to do is basically raise the temperature a little bit. So, here comes the first asteroid. I'm going to slow down the time a little bit and move it, do it from over here maybe. And first collision. All right. This would have been enough for us to uh, release some of the gas right here in this spot. And there's actually going to be fragments possibly coming back. Or maybe not. Maybe no fragments will come back. Um, and because this methane gas right here will be released, we can start releasing the other gases and possibly even um, cause some sort of a chain reaction where a lot of methane gas and whatever was underneath the surface here will start be, um, getting released into the th probably very thin atmosphere that Ares currently has. So we can now kind of simulate that by adding the atmosphere. And the atmosphere right now is about 10% of that on Earth, so we've in increased it a little bit, but not enough for us to call this a terraformed planet. Uh, so we need to start doing something else. Um, now, the thing is, because we've increased the atmosphere, it also gave us a bit of a greenhouse effect. So this, uh, the greenhouse gave, uh, effect is about 2% now, oh, sorry, 2 degrees now. Uh, but that's just not enough for us to, to cause any more release of methane. So we may have to start bringing in some of those other gases we use to terraform Pluto. And if you forgot what they are, here's the link to that video where I terraform Pluto and explain how those greenhouses work. Oh, look at this beauty. Holy cow, this is so gorgeous. Uh, now, so what we need to start doing is essentially release those um, gases, which are also known as CFCs, because they have a much, much higher capacity for heat retention. So in other words, um, we can basically start increasing the pressure. Uh, sorry, not increasing the pressure, increasing the greenhouse effect without really increasing the pressure. Now, the thing is, to get all of the methane ice uh, to turn into gas, we need to launch possibly a few more asteroids in, in very specific locations. So, we're going to launch one right here, a little bit slower. And we're going to launch one is right here as well. So, we're going to launch them in different locations around Ares uh, as a punishment for Pluto, but also because we want to melt um, all of this methane ice and to turn it into gas, so to increase our um, greenhouse effect. So, as all of this is happening, albedo will actually decrease. We'll, we'll start receiving more and more radiative power, so albedo will probably go down to about 0.3, because what's underneath all of this methane is a, the same kind of a red stuff that Pluto has. Um, this red stuff is called toluene, and this is essentially a, a material that is made uh, f by well, when the solar radiation starts to illuminate methane ice, uh, it kind of releases this really interesting material, and it, it's red in color. And so this red stuff will make it, will give it more uh, less albedo. The radiative power will increase. The greenhouse effect will start increasing as well. So we can now possibly reach the uh, same radiative po radiative power as we would have if we had two atmospheres. So not radiative power, but the same uh, greenhouse effect. Now we're going to actually accelerate time a little bit, wait a few more years. And so what's going to be happening now is we're going to bring more and more, or start make, making more and more of those CFCs that will start increasing our greenhouse effect. Now we're going to simulate this by increasing surface pressure. But unfortunately what I've just discovered is that it seems like Eris is also a little bit bugged in this game because no matter what I do, no matter how much I increase the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect is stuck at 6.42. Now that is unfortunate, I mean, it means that we cannot use the greenhouse gases for terraforming. Um, we have to figure something else out, so what else can we do? Um, now, in real life, obviously, we could use greenhouse gases like CFCs to try to terraform uh, this particular dwarf planet, but in this game, right now, we have to improvise. We have to figure out another way of warming it up. So the two ways we can think of are obviously either throw more things at it or uh, heat it up from the inside. 
So what I'm trying to say is on one hand I can obviously launch more asteroids and as you can see the surface temperature is actually increasing as I'm doing this. And this does kind of feel a little bit satisfying because this is, you know, this is revenge for Pluto losing its uh, status. But this will take me a lot of asteroids, it's not very realistic and obviously it is... Uh, there's a limit to satisfaction, right? There's a limit to how much we can hurt Ares for stealing the planet status from Pluto. So instead, let's do something else. So let's actually use another feature in this game called Tidal Heating. And this is the feature right here. So we're going to turn this on. And what this means is that we're go now going to be getting heat from tides. Essentially, if there's something orbiting this... A particular dwarf planet, it will uh, exert a lot of gravitational force on it and it will create tides which will then heat it up. Now what can do that? Well we can obviously choose a very massive object to do that for us or we can choose a very tiny object. Now since we can't really use anything massive like Neptune, we're gonna try to use something smaller like Charon just to represent um, its own satellite called Dysnomia. We actually are going, are going to rename Charon to Dysnomia as well. All right, now what can we do here? Well, one thing we could, we could do is obviously somehow magically increase the mass of this Nomi. Maybe there is some sort of future technology that will increase the mass so much that it will start heating up Ares from the inside. So if we were to look at the temperature here, currently we're not really getting much tidal power. But if I were to increase this mass dramatically by a factor of, let's just say, 10, Okay, and that's what happens. All right, so I didn't really want th th that to happen. I'm, I'm going to actually possibly go back and undo this because it just swallowed my <laughs> dysnomia, uh, my massive dysnomia on top of that. And obviously this hit up, hit up the entire planet to 352 degrees Celsius, but that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do it differently. All right, and here we go. Through the magic of science, we've created a body flying or orbiting around Ares that is named Dysnomia. Now, what is this body? Well, this is essentially a very massive object that is generating a lot of a lot of tidal power on Ares. So even though there's almost no tidal power on this particular object, the um, Ares is actually getting a lot of tidal power from it. So much, in fact, that its effective temperature is now 9 to 11 degrees Celsius. What does it mean? It means that after a few years, it's going to warm up. All of the gases and all of the, uh, sorry, not all of the gases, all of the ices are going to melt and then evaporate. And we're going to have a fully terraformed Ares simply based on this huge tidal power. It, it's essentially being heated up from the inside, kind of like how the microwave works or how um, it feels when you rub your hands really fast. So all of this heat is coming from the inside and it's all from this dysnomia, super massive object that is the only solution that we have currently to our problem because unfortunately this dwarf planet is also bugged in this game. Hopefully they'll fix this in a future update of this game, but right now this seems to be the only way to terraform it. Now it's warming up really, 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 really slow. It's actually going to take possibly like a hundred years for it to warm up. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to actually decrease the temperature to at least minus 10. And let's see what's happening on the surface here. Uh, this is the point where ice should start melting and we should see more and more of surface. And here we go. I believe Ares is now a little bit warmer than the melting temperature of water. And yes, it's just above zero degrees. It's effective temperature increased a little bit as well because I did kind of move my dysnomia a little bit. But here we go. So this is now a somewhat terraformed Aries. It's about to reach its stable temperature. The temperature is still increasing, but it's going to stabilize around 18 degrees Celsius, which is just a little bit warmer than Earth. It has liquid water on the surface. We can kind of see it if we remove the clouds. So there is liquid water right there. The only problem is that it's really, really, really dark here. So this is a very dark place. Definitely for people that like to live in darkness or don't like sun very much. So if you don't like being suntanned, if you like to live in a basement, this would be a place for you. Uh, but all in all, though, uh, it looks relatively beautiful. It is a really nice blue-ish atmosphere. It's uh, it's a planet, a dwarf planet with really relatively low gravity, so you can jump really high. And uh, you don't really have to worry too much about anything except for tremendous tidal power from 
this Nomia right here, which would probably cause ridiculously high earthquakes and tsunamis. Yay! Uh, but in reality, we would not be terraforming it like this. We would obviously be using greenhouse gases. Unfortunately for us, right now this dwarf planet is bug uh, bugged a little bit, so we can't really use greenhouse gases. We might have to do this again in a future video. For now, this is the only way I was able to terraform Ares, and it looks like our mission is complete. So not only did we punish Ares by throwing various... Uh, asteroids at it, but we also did it by creating a huge tidal power effect, which has now warmed up the planet to the level of being terraformed. So it has one uh, atmospheric pressure of pressure, it has good temperature, and it has liquid water. Uh, in reality, of course, it would probably look something more like this. The water would be covering a lot more surface, and it would very likely to be a water world, where you don't really even see the water because it's so dark. Anyway, so that's really it. Thank you guys for watching. Game you later. And as I leave this beautiful dark dwarf planet, I would like to remind you to subscribe if you like space videos, to like this video if you enjoyed it, and to check out some of the other Space Engine or Universe Sandbox 2 videos that I've made, and check out these links if you want to see where they are. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You're the best. I love you. And game you later, bye-bye. And also bye-bye, Eris. Nice to meet you.